Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we've just been waiting for folks to log on on our end. Uh, and so we will wait about another 30 seconds to see if anyone else signs on, and we'll begin our webinar shortly. All right, I think we have a quorum. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Karina from Rocky Mountain Institute. It's great to have everyone signing in and extremely excited to welcome you to this webinar. Um, I lead the Electricity Innovation Lab or, or eLab team at Rocky Mountain Institute. Today I'm joined by my colleagues Lauren Schweisberg and Jeff Waller. And together we're here to host the second of three webinars leading up to eLab Forge in under a week away. We are extremely excited uh, for the work that we will undertake with you at FORGE and for the opportunity to work together on the very ambitious and important questions each of your teams will be bringing to FORGE. So thank you once again for all the prep work and all the foundation work leading up uh, on your end to our work today in this week. Um, well, the purpose of these webinars, there are two that are topical and then the one on Friday, the all-team webinars to provide uh, an understanding of background on what to expect, logistics, um, and more practical information about our time together. These first two topical ones are intended to provide what we call ground level information and concepts as an underlayment for our work together so that when we are together in person, we can move faster as a team. Um, and the webinars also enable us to provide introduction to two of our faculty in advance of FORGE and to hear directly from their perspectives. Today, we're very excited to have Carl Linville and Janine migden ostrander from Regulatory Assistance Project, or RAP, to join us. Janine will also join us in person as faculty next week. Uh, they're here to discuss the priorities and role of regulators in serving low-income customers and how stakeholders typically engage in regulatory proceedings as a jumping off point for our work together as we think about um, how we can change stakeholder and upgrade stakeholder engagement moving forward. Before we dig in, just a few logistic guidelines uh, to make this a uh, workable session from a tech standpoint. So first, all participants, you guys, you're all on automatic mute, and you will be muted through the duration of the, web the webinar. The webinar will last approximately an hour. We'll end at 3.30 uh, p.m. Eastern time. And we invite you to send questions throughout the webinar. Uh, so please use the comment submission box to ask directions uh, directly to the host. And what we'll do on our end is get a sense of the questions from the group and help us to determine what Q&A we can do um, following our interview with Carl and Janine uh, and help us curate in what order um, and the flow. Last point I'll make is that this webinar is being recorded so that other members of your team who are unable to join at this time can listen in uh, before we get together at board. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Carl and Linville. Uh, Carl Linville and Janine migden ostrander from, from RAP. RAP is an independent, nonpartisan, non-governmental organization that is dedicated to accelerating the transition to a clean, reliable, and efficient energy future. Dr. Carl Linville is a principal with RAP. Uh, he leads RAP's work on renewable energy integration and transmission planning in the Western United States as well as working on a host of other regulatory issues. Janine migden ostrander is a principal at RAP, uh, where she advises regulators and advocates on energy efficiency, renewable energy, demand response, distributed generation, and integrated resource planning, and microgrids, <laughs> among other topics. Uh, so we're gonna do this, uh, folks who are part of our uh, call this morning uh, with Josh Gould, saw that we went, uh, we, we had a brief slideshow here. This slide, this will be a little different. Each of the slides will show the question that I'm asking to Janine and Carl, uh, but the content of the webinar will be primarily through interview format, uh, which we hope to enjoy. So Janine, I'm gonna ask if I can start with you. And my first question um, as we man the slides from New York is what what are commissioners specific, so we're focused on low-income communities here and how uh, regulating bodies and commissions serve them. 
So in, uh, from your knowledge, what are commissioners' specific obligations to low-income communities that are distinct from obligation to all customers? Um, thank you. Um, generally, there are no um, specific distinctions unless they're written into the statute. So if there's a statute that says that they want that the policymakers legislature wants the Public Utility Commission to take a particular action, then that would give them an opportunity to do that. However, a lot of commissions have viewed the plight of low-income customers and affordability as an issue that they should nevertheless address, and they try to do so within their broad statutory authority. For, and so in those examples, the commission is leading to try to solve a problem to create uh, benefits for customers. Um, other, and an example of that would be the commission, the Ohio Commission's creation of the percentage of income payment plan. Other examples might be approving settlements and utility ap applications that create benefits for customers. Um, for example, a, a approving a shareholder fund for bill assistance, um, certain rate designs, uh, low income aggregation programs in some states. So there, there are tools that the commission can choose to use and should be encouraged to use. Thanks, Janine. And I think I'm gonna, if it's okay with you guys, I'm gonna switch on and off, give you each a, a moment to breathe, uh, but feel free if you wanna direct the question to the other person. But Carl, I'll move to you. Um, can regulators just tell utilities what to do? What's that relationship and why, why or why not? Um, so, uh, you know, regulators, uh, uh, no, they can't just tell the utility what to do. I mean, they have, uh, they have a scope of authority over the, uh, utility that, um, is, uh, part of the franchise agreement with the utility. So the utility is given, um, uh, franchise over a, specific area of um, of the grid uh, and they're the default provider to all the customers uh, in that area of the grid um, talking here about a, uh, a vertically integrated utility situation <clears throat> just for example we could talk about others as well um, but um, in the um, uh, so along with that franchise comes obligations to serve all customers uh, and uh, to provide uh, reliable service at a just and reasonable rate. So uh, the utility uh, commission, the regulator, uh, determines whether the rates that are being um, uh, requested by the utility to charge to customers, whether they're just and reasonable or not. Uh, they do make determinations on that, and uh, so they can determine that uh, utility rates are not just and reasonable and adjust them accordingly. Um, they also have obligation to serve, which means that the regulator, uh, if, the, if the quality of service is not uh, up to par, is not, if there's not universal service available to all customers um, at the requisite level of quality and reliability, then uh, the regulator can impose fines and um, things like that. So uh, so the regulator just can't sort of carte blanche tell the utility what to do. Um, there is a scope for their authority uh, defined by the statute and the most, the broadest, uh, you know, authorities come from those two things that I mentioned. Um, an obligation to serve all customers, uh, and secondly, uh, an obligation to serve at just and reasonable rates. Thanks, Carl. And I lied, I'm gonna ask the next question to you as we get our slides synced up. <laughs> okay. Um, in what ways can a regulator take up a certain issue? So for example, open a proceeding or hold a commissioner's information meeting, uh, how can a regulator take up a certain issue? What are so, the relevant differences between each of these tactics? Okay. Um, so, so certain, you know, certain um, 
issues happen on a predetermined schedule uh, and it varies by state. But for example, um, many states have requirements that a utility file a resource plan, which indicates how they're planning to ensure that there's adequate resources to meet everybody's needs for the next, uh, for the you know period of time forward. And that obligation is to file something every three years. Um, so that, that happens on a regular basis. Likewise, uh, a rate case might happen on a regular basis as well. There may be a, 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 an established pattern or even a requirement that there be a rate case every so many years. Uh, that varies by states though. Some states, uh, uh, the uh, utility is not required to come in with a rate case. Um, they can just come in when uh, they feel that rate needs to be adjusted or the commission can say, um, you know, conditions have changed to the point that we want you to um, to file a rate case. So, so there are those kind of routine things and then there's the special conditions that happen where, you know, something is going on where, you know, maybe there's a, a quality of service problem or a health and safety issue or, um, you know, something, there might be a part of the grid where people are losing power more frequently than is acceptable. Um, and, and in response to that, um, uh, anyone can petition the commission to open a proceeding to attempt to get that resolved. So they would, uh, and usually the commission would respond with something called an investigatory docket, where they would then take in the, uh, take on that issue in question. Um, Following, there's another kind of proceeding that follows up from legislative activity, where there may be a uh, there may be uh, a bill that passes that say that uh, the utility is required to um, offer uh, uh, solar programs to low-income customers, for example, uh, and the bill specifies that. The utility now has an obligation to create this program and serve so many customers. Um, and then in response to that, the utility commission would open a rulemaking docket where they would um, amend the regulations uh, to incorporate the new legislative requirements. Um, in all of these proceedings, um, uh, stakeholders, including representatives of low-income communities, have an opportunity to participate. Um, how uh, the scope of their opportunity varies by state. Uh, in some states, they low-income customers might choose to operate mostly through a uh, consumer advocate, like uh, Janine had a job for many years when she was a consumer counsel for Ohio. Um, so they, uh, there's a mechanism for that, but there's also the opportunity to directly intervene, to establish oneself as a party in a proceeding and to directly become involved. So we could get into details what that involvement looks like, but those are basically the types of proceedings that happen and why they happen and when they happen. Thank you, Carl. Next question, Janine. In general, can you explain to us how does, how does the PUC decision-making process work? Um, it depends. There, there's a number of different kinds of filings that would impact how the decision process would work. One kind of filing might be a utility filing where a utility files because they want an increase in rates or they want approval to construct something or um, they have to file an integrated resource plan pursuant to commission to statute or commission rules. Um, so those are some examples. And um, the second kind, and in that case, that's usually going to be an adjudicative proceeding. And I'll get into that a little bit more in just a moment. And the other kind of case you might have is a commission ordered investigation or a rulemaking, which are generally more generic in nature as opposed to utility specific, and will deal with issues such as you know, potential rules on grid modernization, performance-based rate making, maybe um, DER aggreg aggregation of distributed energy resources, um, or they could be a specific commission investigation as to a, a particular utility, which involves something like um, 
utility unlawfully backfilling customers or utility over recovery. The third kind of proceeding generally is, and I'm putting these in broad categories, is where a stakeholder may file a complaint, for example, a violation of consumer protection issues or an individual customer who has a, uh, a grievance against a utility that has not been resolved informally may file. Uh, and then the third, or they may um, be, or you might have like a ratepayer advocate filing because the utility has excessive rates. In those third cases, the burden of proof is on the complainant or the stakeholder. And in some instances, if it's a complex case, like, an, uh, like um, alleging that the rates are too high, it's a very hard case to prove because the burden of proof is on the consumer group and they don't have the data. So given these various categories of who files cases, you, usually the commission will address it either through, like in a policy case, through uh, comments. They'll seek comments from all stakeholders. Stakeholders can file comments. Sometimes there's an opportunity for reply comments. And then the commission renders a decision there may be an opportunity to file applications for rehearing where you say, no, the commission erred because it, it did this and it didn't consider that. And the commission will reconsider and then issue a final order. Um, if it is, a, if it's, and then um, the other kind of proceeding is more of an evidentiary proceeding where, for example, utility is filing for a rate increase. Uh, they would have to file a significant amount of evidence to demonstrate the basis for that increase. Parties could intervene, challenge those assumptions of the utility, present witnesses. You'll have a hearing then where you'll have expert testimony from both the utility, sometimes the commission staff, and also from interveners presenting their viewpoints. At the end of the hearing, there is an opportunity for briefs, after which usually there is an opportunity for reply briefs where you can comment on what each of everybody else on everybody else's brief and then it goes to the commission for a decision uh, that decision could be the commissioners um, it could it could be made it could be made by the commissioners directly or sometimes there is a uh, recommended decision by a hearing judge which then gets reviewed by the commission um, and the decision is made um, there's also, and often these decisions have to be discussed in an open meeting because of sunshine laws, so as opposed to the commissioners sitting, getting together in a room by themselves and talking about it. Although a lot of commissions get around the sunshine rules by meeting one-on-one -on -one if they have five members, for example, because that doesn't create a quorum. So that in very broad strokes is how a proceeding um, functions. Thanks, Janine. Carl, uh, who can open a proceeding and when? Um, well, I think I think Janine just provided <clears throat> um, a number of examples of different types of proceedings that could be opened. Uh, basically, <clears throat> only the commission can order that a proceeding be opened. Um, anyone can petition the proceed the commission to open a proceeding uh, just like uh, Janine just discussed um, it could be a complaint quality of service or um, you know discriminatory rates or or something like that um, <clears throat> uh, or you know it could be a uh, uh, a broader issue that you know like for example these rulemaking issues which are often precipitated by some by some legislation that <clears throat> calls for the commission to place new obligations on the utility so uh, so basically the simple answer to the question is only the commission can open a proceeding uh, uh, anyone can petition to open the commission to open a proceeding uh, in some cases, you know, the, the commission is is required to open a proceeding. For example, oftentimes in legislation, it will require that a regulation based upon a new statute be enacted within 180 days or something like that. So 
well, the commission is the one that formally opens the proceeding. There may be some very uh, prescribed timelines uh, that they need to react to in ensuring that a proceeding is open and a decision is ultimately arrived at in the prescribed time. Thank you, Carl. Uh, and thank you, both of you, for answering our predetermined questions before we get to our uh, off-the-cuff live questions. <laughs> I really appreciate <laughs> providing this, this uh, foundation base. Uh, so next, Janine, uh, what is exactly is a rate case? Okay, a rate case is an application by a utility company to increase rates. Occasionally, it could be a commission-ordered investigation to decrease rates, but that is, um, or a consumer complaint for a decrease in rates, but that's pretty rare. 99% of cases are utilities filing to increase rates. And what the commission does is it, it's a pretty lengthy process. It can last six to nine months to a year. And what basically happens in a rate case is the utility is seeking to increase its revenue requirements, and there is a formula that is used in rate cases under which the revenue requirements are determined by looking at all the operating expenses. And the operating expenses can be things from postage to labor to transportation costs. Um, it runs tree trimming. It runs the gamut. There may be 15, 20 issues that you're looking at with regard to utility expenses. Then you also look at what is the utility's rate base. And by rate base, you, it basically is re referring to all the plant and service. Uh, and, and if some states permit it, the plant that is under construction plus working capital. And you take a look at that, and it's on that piece, which requires investment from investors, that, you, that the commission will add a rate of return. And so... so so once all of these pieces and parts are determined, you come up with a new revenue re revenue requirement based upon the operating co and you're using basically a test year, a sample year that could be, you know, um, historic, recently historic, half historic, half future, and updated or completely future. Um, a lot of places use a mix of both. And so you take a look at that one year period and you're looking at all the operating expenses all the plant and service, the return on that plant and service, you get a revenue requirement, and then you allocate it by function, transmission, distribution, generation, and also by customer class. So, for example, if residential customers are responsible for 40% of the load that the utility has, then they would probably get an allocation of close to 40% of the, co of, the, of the cost increase. And then the next step is, you then, um, and you do likewise for commercial and industrial. And then the last step is you determine what is the rate design. Are you going to have a flat rate? Are you going to have a rate that inclines the more you use? So like the first 250 or 500 kWh might be under a lower price, and then after that it goes up higher. Or are you going to have a time of use rate with on-peak and off-peak rates? So, and, and once all that is determined, the new rates go into effect. Thanks, Janine. This is um, Lauren, and we're seeing a question come in related to this question on how does a rate case for a consumer-owned utility differ from the procedure that you just described for investor-owned utilities? Okay, consumer-owned utilities are often referred to as co-ops, and in most states, the co-ops are not regulated by the commission. There are a couple of states, like Arkansas, that do regulate co-ops, but pretty much they are self-regulated. So they would have an internal process to determine what their needs are, and then it would have to go through their board and be approved, and then the rates would go up. And the theory of not having regulation for a co-op is that the, all the members are owners. So if they don't like what the co-op is doing, they can vote the people in charge out. Um, whereas with an investor-owned utility, the customers have absolutely no power to do anything like that. And so they need regulation for protection. Thanks. And I'll just a quick reminder for folks on the phone. We're seeing some questions begin to come in, uh, but please do go ahead and type those questions into your into the host so we can organize those. Um, Carl, question for you. 
What does it mean to be a party or an intervener? Um, so, uh, the, the, uh, a commission at the end of the day, a commission decides, um, it makes its decision on establishing the rate. Let's talk about the rate case again for a second. So at the end of the day, the commission is going to make a decision uh, that will implement rates. Um, in considering, uh, in uh, looking at all of the evidence, uh, they have to rely upon the record of the proceeding. So um, so the, all the information that was submitted during the proceeding and accepted into the record of the proceeding, um, whether it be testimony or exhibits um, or whatever, um, that uh, provides the foundation for uh, the commission's decision. Now, you can't be a part of the record if you're not a party uh, or given intervener status. So in, in the rate case proceeding, if you want your voice directly reflected in the record, um, uh, then you need to become a part of that proceeding and be granted, granted intervention status. Now, sometimes uh, it's different places, uh, there's a different level of difficulty in becoming an intervener. Um, this is, a, as you can already tell from our discussion today, this is a complicated um, forum in which to uh, uh, become engaged. So a lot of a lot of people, like uh, low-income customers, uh, will choose, for example, will choose to work through a, uh, a consumer advocate and the staff of the commission, and perhaps other interveners in the proceeding to get their voice into the proceeding. Uh, they may even be called upon as a witness by somebody to provide evidence into the proceeding, in which case they don't need to formally be an intervener, but they need to be uh, accepted as a witness for a party and, and called into the proceeding. So, so basically, um, if, you, uh, if you want to become an active participant in a proceeding and have your um, information directly uh, considered as part of the record uh, of the proceeding and as a, a, a basis for the decision, then you need to be granted intervention status. Uh, if you aren't granted intervention status, you still have recourse. You can work through parties that do have intervention status to get your uh, message through and you can help them by giving them information and data and so forth that helps them to make a case um, uh, on your behalf, so uh, uh, so that's why that's what it means to be a party uh, uh, or an intervener uh, to a uh, contested case before the commission. Thanks, Carl. Um... A question to either of you. It seems like there's a real disparity, and this is coming into the line, it seems like there's a real disparity in resources and expertise between low income uh, and customer advocates and utilities. What do you think is the best way for uh, LMI and environmental justice groups to meaningfully participate and influence commission decisions, particularly in light of these resource constraints, uh, which can be, in some instances, very severe? Um, I can I can take a first crack at this one <laughs> as a former consumer advocate. Uh, I think there's a number of responses to this. First of all, um, when a utility files a rate case, their costs for that rate case are recovered in, in rates. When I talked about the various kinds of expenses utilities have that are viewed, one of them is rate case expense. For the consumer advocate side of the coin, um, that is not the case. Um, if they are not, if there's a state agency that has that has funding to do it, then they they can recover some of their costs, but their budgets are woefully inadequate when compared to that of the utility. So one of the things that I would first recommend is trying to find a mechanism within the state legislature to get funding and financing 
um, for interveners. California has a process whereby interveners can petition the commission for recovery of their costs at the end of a case. But again, you have to have the money up front and you, you're taking a gamble that you're going that the commission is going to give you that money at the end. So, so there may be, um, so about 40 states do have consumer advocate agencies, about 10 states do not. And so those 10 states should really work towards getting a, a, a state consumer advocate in their state that could be in these cases. Having said that, you know, very often you find that the consumer advocate has so many cases going on, especially if utilities seem to file, and, I, and I've noticed a pattern of that in one particular state, where all the utilities file at the same time so that the staff resources, the consumer advocate resources are, are just totally drained. Um, and so often what happens is you form coalitions. For example, environmental groups can form coalitions if you have several interveners and you divide up topics. You know, and you file joint briefs and you work together. Uh, consumers Council in Ohio, when I was the Consumers Council, we did that an awful lot. We had a consumer environmental coalition where we, uh, Consumers Council did most of the heavy lifting, but other parties volunteered to do pieces and parts. We came to agreement on the positions on the issues and we divided up who was briefing what. And that spread, allowed the money to go much further. And it was, and it was a very sizable force to have a brief file that may have included as many as 10 interveners. The commission could not ignore that. And so it's also from a strategy standpoint, not only a financial standpoint, a really good thing if you can build coalitions and work with other parties to resolve, um, to intervene in the cases, especially when you have multiple cases. So one becomes an expert on one issue, another on another issue. And I, I would just add um, two things to what Janine just said. Um, one is that uh, in rate cases in particular, um, there may be a requirement to have uh, public meetings around the state uh, where you inform the public that, the, uh, that there's a rate case filed, uh, that that rate uh, case could impact them. Um, so in this, these kind of forums, it's not a formal um, uh, part of the proceeding in the hearing room, but it's basically taking input uh, from the public. And uh, I was a commissioner in Nevada. We used to travel around the state to different places to, uh, to get people, to make sure that people were informed uh, that, that this was happening. Um, and so usually the uh, utility would make presentations, the staff of the commission would make presentations describing and then uh, what, what was going on in the case and then there would be a opportunity for public comment. Um, they, these actually can have a big impact. Um, you know, they, uh, they particularly have, um, can have a big political impact, uh, which can, then cause you know legislation to be filed to cause people to take up um, your cause and so forth and and carry through uh, to implement changes in statutes that then will find their way down through to um, to regulations at the commission. I just for a real quick example, uh, Janine mentioned the intervener compensation opportunity which is not available in most states but for example if uh, you know perhaps that would be something that could come out in a, a public uh, one of these public sessions that people say you know we don't feel like we're adequately represented in this state either we don't have a consumer advocate that's representing our view or uh, we don't have the wherewithal to make sure that our view is uh, represented in the proceeding and so we can't become a formal part of the record um, you know we need somebody to help us uh, to uh, to get status uh, in these proceedings to have representation um, and then uh, legislate uh, legislators can act you know can pick it up and and take this and and implement uh, legislation uh, which then the regulatory body uh, would have to implement through regulation. So, um, so I think you know what Janine described is is the far more um, important 
you know, uh, and common um, avenue for directly participating in a proceeding. But you also have other opportunities to try to affect uh, the regulatory environment. And so I encourage people to consider those as well. Thanks for that example. Um, and that I hope it's okay with both Carl and Janine. We're going to go and begin integrating questions that we're getting online. Um, that, that was a great example. Given constraints, both of you, at the core, what do you think stakeholders need in order to file a compelling comment? Well, I, I'll, 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 I'll just I'll try something, and then Janine, you can um, fix whatever I I failed <laughs> to do here. Uh, they but, they'll need fixing, Carl. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I, to me, as a um, the most powerful thing to me is uh, evidence. You know, facts. Um, I know that. Uh, facts are ridiculed uh, by some in the world that we live in today, sadly. Uh, but, you know, fa uh, factual uh, information that you can bring forward is very powerful. Uh, and uh, illustrating that factual information is very powerful with, with images, uh, you know, whether they're graphs or, or figures or something that uh, you know, really can make an impact and then can be repeated, you know, uh, uh, printed in documents and so forth. So factual information and then personal stories are also very powerful. Um, you know, for example, uh, when I was a commissioner in Nevada, we had a rate case where there was a large rate case and uh, uh, AARP uh, uh, came forward and, and brought forth witnesses about how this um, uh, rate case, if the, if the rate request that the utility was requesting went into effect, how that would affect their monthly budget. Uh, and they had a series of people just walk up and say, you know, this is my budget. Uh, this is how much I have for utilities. Um, if my utility bill goes up by $10 a month, then that $10 directly comes out of what I can spend on food. And I don't have enough for food right now. Uh, that's a powerful story, especially when you're, when you see that person. So, um, so I think those are, you know, kind of the two evidence and uh, personal stories I think are the most powerful. I, I would agree with Carl. I think he hit the nail on the head on this. The, the only thing I would add is when you have constraints with respect to resources, coalition build, share the work, get other parties who are similarly interested in these cases um, to work with you um, and and divide up the work. Um, that's one of the best. That's one of the best ways to stretch your resources as much as you can. If you are representing low-income customers. Um, the various consumer councils around the state, around the country, have different views about it. Some take special interest in low income. Some feel that they're charged to represent residential customers. They can't show a preference for one subgroup of residential over another. Um, but try to work with the consumer advocate as well um, and see where there are opportunities for um, chiming in with them on a me too basis. But consumer advocates will always appreciate you know, having people come in and testify to make the case, as Carl was talking about, because that's very compelling. Thank you, Janine. Um, Carl, you can take this one if you want. What's the most exciting thing you've seen a PC say or do around low-income issues? <laughs> uh, well, uh, um, I'd have to reflect on that. Uh, to come up with the right, you know, what's the most, but I'll tell you one that recently has been pretty uh, exciting to me was, you know, there's this issue of, um, uh, you know, electric vehicles and can, you know, are there any benefits really for low and moderate income customers for electric, for electric vehicles? Uh, and there's this great uh, program in, in Portland. And I'm not thinking of the name of it right now off the top of my head, uh, but where uh, 
uh, where some um, uh, used uh, Nissan Leafs, or actually, I think they were Honda Fits, um, were uh, repurposed uh, uh, for a low-income uh, living community. Uh, the utility uh, put in charging infrastructure. Um, the vehicles were made available on a you know checkout basis, kind of like a zip car basis. Um, and you know, I think that uh, that it fits and it fills a niche. It, not only does it bring clean transportation, you know, zero carbon transportation to that community, uh, but it also uh, fills a niche that you know, oftentimes uh, people in, in a community they they may have a job interview that's in an inconvenient location, uh, and public transportation is tough. Uh, they don't own a car. Um, how do you get there? Uh, you may have doctor's appointments that are needed, you know, taxi cabs or even even rideshare can be uh, can be a little bit expensive. Um, so I think, you know, this is a so this program uh, I found very um, exciting because I think uh, you have the combination of of uh, uh, repurposed uh, electric vehicles being low cost right now, so they could be, um, so it was a low cost program. Um, it broadened the ex accessibility of electric infrastructure to a lower income community that otherwise wouldn't have had that charging infrastructure. Uh, it filled a transportation need in that community. Um, and it's it's a brand new program, so we'll see you know how important it is, but I, th I think that that one has really been uh, exciting for me. Yeah, I have a couple I can add to that um, list to what Carl said that I think could be very that I've seen as being very valuable. Um, one is a very simple program, the Roundup program, where customers can round up their bill payment to the next dollar, and all of that money that is collected then goes to help low-income customers. Another is the percentage of income payment plan that's in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and um, I believe one other state I can't recall. And under that program, a, a, a qualifying low-income customer, in Ohio they set it at 150% of the poverty guideline, um, is eligible to pay a percentage of their income towards their utility bill as opposed to paying the full utility bill. Uh, and this is an, and the percentage was set in Ohio. It used to be 15%. We got it lowered to 12%, um, 6% for gas, 6% for electric. Um, the average customer will pay 2 to 3% of their income for their utility bills. A low-income customer may pay up to 20%. So this so this um, results in a savings to customers as to what their payment obligations are. And a third program is one in states that have um, that have been restructured, whereby you have marketers providing competitive service, and, and the idea is to aggregate the low-income customers and have marketers bid to provide those customers with the um, caveat that whatever rate, whatever the winning bid is, it has to be lower than the than the utility's default rate, so that customers are immediately getting a savings. So those are just three quick examples of some programs. Thank you, Janine. So how would you, both or either of you, how would you advise listeners to think about the difference between legislative power and regulatory power? So, you know, when to influence legislate, uh, legislature versus the commissioner? I think you need to look at the at the at the commission's statutory authority. You start there and you say, is it broad enough to do what we would like them to do? For example, we want them to do rulemaking on performance-based uh, regulation, so, or we want them to do rulemaking setting a setting up a separate rate discount program for low income. You look at the le legislative language and see if it's broad enough to enable the commission to do that. If it's not, then you've got to go to the legislature to make sure that that language is broad enough to enable it. If the, if the language in the statutes 
is broad enough to enable it to enable the commission to do it, then you go to the commission and um, request a rulemaking on the on the subject. So we, so you start basically with what does the um, legislation permit. Um, one thing I would note here is that some commissions um, will just go forward and lead because they think it's the right thing. They think the legislature would be supportive of it. Others are more cautious because they're afraid of repercussions from the, from the legislature if they go out on a limb too far, such as cutting their budget the next time the budget process comes around, or they're worried about a reversal in a court um, if, the, if, the, if the case is appealed to the courts. So you really want to make sure the commission has the grounding to do it if they're, if they're in a cautious mode. So related to that, um, you know, there are many states undertaking broad regulatory reforms right now. Um, for instance, New York Rev. How did that come about? Uh, what is, are you seeing the process for undertaking major reform? Are those processes similar across states or is that process different? Uh, feel free to speak to any examples that you, that you know better. I think it's going to vary on a state-by-state -state basis as to what they want to do. The, commissions, the commissioners themselves are usually appointed by the governor. And in the case of New York with New York Res, Governor Cuomo was very supportive of trying to advance a new agenda for regulation that was more consistent with clean energy goals. And so the commission had the full support of the governor and I, and I believe the legislature as well. So a lot of the things that, so they were able to, to act within that context. Um, again, it really depends on the politics in each individual state. And I, and I don't know offhand, maybe Carl, you know, whether or not there was specific enabling legislation on REV um, that I'm not sure uh, I think, of. Well, I think uh, in the case of REV, the, um, I believe that the New York Commission had a lot of authority to independently pursue REV without specific legislative um, empowerment. Um, and so, and I think they're a little, I think they're unusual in that respect, but I'm, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a New York expert, but that's, that's my understanding. Um, what other um, category of, of change that I'd like to talk about. So it goes back to something Janine mentioned earlier about coalition building. You know, a lot of times um, the, a change that's happening uh, is impacting a lot of different parties. So it's not that just, that just one party uh, perceives that there's a change and there's a need uh, for some kind of regulatory change to keep up with that. Uh, you know, so a, a lot of the things that we work on at RAP have to do with um, updating the utility business model, you know, updating how the utility makes money to enable um, clean energy and energy efficiency uh, to take on a bigger piece of the portfolio. Um, so in these cases, you know, so the, uh, the utility has, a, has an interest in seeing a the way that they make money change because uh, they see that the world is changing around them. Um, the providers of the new services or the new technologies see a need for a change. Uh, the uh, environmental advocates, for example, or consumer advocates may see opportunities or, or threats uh, in how the change happens. Uh, so, you know, a powerful way of implementing change can be to build a coalition uh, that includes as broad a set of parties as possible to negotiate a path forward. And, uh, you know, if, if you have a utility that's willing to work with you on that, it's, it's very powerful if you can come forward uh, with with a you know all party proposal or or a almost all party proposal uh, for uh, for change that produces benefits for um, for everybody 
and addresses a range of issues together. Uh, because this one-off issue making is very difficult. Um, you know, it's and it's it tends to be adversarial. Uh, but coalition building, where you can combine issues together and make trades and do something that creates mutual benefit, you know, is a, is a good way to enable then the regulator to implement <clears throat> a whole range of policies. And I think that's how. Uh, things are working in, in uh, several other states. And, and if I could just um, pile on to Carl's uh, comment, and that is that one of the things that we've been, um, we've worked on at RAP and I worked on prior to joining RAP and I think is, and I think is, is really important is to try to build coalitions that are not just with like parties. So if you can get environmentalists to work with consumer advocates, to work with clean energy advocates, which may include companies that um, are in the clean energy business. The more diverse and large your coalition is, the more the commission feels compelled to listen to what you have to say. So if you can work these things out, and the, the other advantage of the coalition is it keeps you from being blindsided and getting them to, and having them take positions that you really have a problem with because you've worked them out before. Um, and it's a way to, you know, kind of come together as Carl was talking about in terms of negotiating within the coalition. So I encourage all of you, if you get into cases, to seek out other, other parties to join with. Thank you, Janine. Thank you, Carl. We have a couple of other questions um, that we won't have time for, but I'll just maybe give a little uh, uh, a little bit of a sneak preview that uh, some of these questions are around uh, new processes that some commissions are taking on to uh, new around new collaborative processes that involve stakeholders helping to identify and sometimes uh, lead a joint commission. Uh, and so we'll, we hope to be able to address those in person with our faculty. And with that, Lauren, I know you were trying to wrap, uh, but I'll hand it over to you to let us know next steps. No problem. Thanks, Karina. Um, thank you so much to Carl and Janine for joining us today. I think it was a really interesting conversation, and hopefully everyone on the line learned a lot. Um, this isn't the last time to learn and hear about this information. Um, many of your teams at Forge are tackling these very issues, so we look forward to working with you next week um, on your projects um, that interface with regulatory proceedings and all that entails. Um, the second way to continue this conversation is, as we mentioned, Janine will be in person at Forge, so uh, make sure to find her if you have lingering questions and start a conversation and in addition to Janine, um, a couple of the teams will also have uh, Public Utilities Commission staff or former staff, um, so be sure to seek out those folks as well for a different perspective. Um, and finally, as a reminder, um, this is our second of three webinars, so on Friday, please join us for an overview of the FORGE process and some more logistical information before we are all together next week. Um, thank you all so much, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.